Father, thank you for this opportunity to live for you. Help us to have a forgiving heart and a servant heart, Lord, as we heard. And help us now as we look into your words, Lord. Pray that you would open my mouth that I could speak what you have me to say. Give us a love for truth, Lord. We pray for your blessing on this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. things on my mind, and uh, yet I don't know if I have much to say. I mean, well, uh, it's just been a lot of a lot of things on my mind the last uh, last few days, and uh, I just ask that you'd you'd pray that I could speak what what's truth what's uh, my my thoughts I don't feel like my thoughts or notes are very organized I uh, uh, I do want to read some scriptures then, but I I think I'm going to start by sharing some of my testimony or some of my life journey. Not just, not just to share a testimony, but, uh, because I do want to make a point, you know, about it. And, Anna, to, to some of you, this is pretty familiar. To others, maybe not familiar. And there's some brothers here that I'm sure have never heard much of my story. So, Anyway, uh, I grew up in an Amish home in a big Amish community, and uh, in maybe uh, <coughs> in a good home, I'll, I'll put it that way. I mean, sure, there was things wanting, and there's things wanting in in the Amish churches, but it was a good home. I mean, we were taught. A lot of things out of the Bible. We were taught a lot of things about our history, about the history of where we came from, and uh, and so as a young boy already, I was like intrigued by the Anabaptists. I'd look through the Martyrs' Mirror before I was I wasn't a very good reader, so I didn't read a whole lot. But I'd look through those pictures, and they told me a lot of words. And I was just, this was fascinating. Like, these men were, these men were men like I wanted to be like. You know, obviously these weren't, these weren't uh, just the people I'm looking at when I look around. It didn't seem that way. Men who had a, uh, a goal. Men who had a, noble cause that they were seeking. And and not only that, I'd meet, you know, I was always, I'd like kind of look out of my shell and I'd see people who were different. These people fascinated me. People that weren't like, like people like I'm looking at today. People who you could see were not in some... Uh, 
shell. Uh, people who it seemed to me in my young mind that were just willing to do what's right regardless. Who were pursuing holiness and righteousness. And some of these people were people that were cast out of the more established systems. And I had an eye for these people. But I only, for the longest time in my life, for a long time in my life, I should say, I only admired these people. Just like there were people in the days of Jesus who admired him. They just, they loved him maybe and they admired him for his miracles. They admired him for how bluntly and openly he rebuked the religious leaders of the day. Um, They just admired his transparency. Admired the truth and light that was about this man. But that was it. They just admired it. I think that's the way it's always been. There's been these people who are only admirers of the followers of truth. I imagine when Noah's Ark was being built, that in spite of all the mockery and all the people that scorned Noah, I have a pretty good feeling there was a lot of people around that admired him. And that really, like maybe when their friends were gone, or maybe when they were there, they'd look at that ark and just have to marvel. Like, this man has a noble cause. There's something different about this man. They may have even walked up close to the door and tried to look on the inside. They might have gone up and felt it. But when it started raining, these people were screaming because they would not walk inside that door. It took a humble man who was willing to lose his reputation to walk inside that ark. It took a man who was willing to go against the scorn of all the world. Anyway, Carol, would you want to send somebody up with a glass of water? Oh. Anyway, I, I grew up and I joined the Amish church. And I still, I still wanted light. And when I saw some light, maybe not immediately in some cases, but... I accepted some light. I remember the time, this was after I was married. In fact, it was after I was in the ministry in the Amish church. That, thank you, Adam. That there was a, there was a lot of corruption. Like, there was a lot of, for those of you who were there, I mean, there was like just a lot of corrupt things that an old, old, old Amish community just couldn't really get their hands on. I mean, it was just... And for those of us who wanted to have more light, who wanted to let the light shed into these churches to expose some things, it was pretty hard. We were, it was not wanted, this light. 
there was works of darkness within. And I remember one time when I was at a, at a at one of the ministers' meetings, and it was a real like it was a real critical time for me. Like I knew there was these works of darkness here, and it was coming close to the time where where we were wanting to see if we could go on with uh, with the council and the the communion meeting, and and I was really struggling. Like, can I do this? Can I partake of this? Or is it wrong for me? And I remember at that minister's meeting, I just could not, I could not say yes or no. I was just, I was struggling about this. And I went home that night. And it was late. It was a late meeting. And I got home and I just, I didn't, couldn't sleep. And I wanted to read. I didn't know where to read. I was desperate for truth, for life. And I think, if I remember right, I sat there on a chair with my Bible open, but I didn't consciously open it, and was just like daydreaming for a while, or thinking. And then I looked at my Bible, and I was open to Ephesians 5, and I started reading there in Ephesians 5, how light has no fellowship with darkness. And that you should not be partakers of these works of darkness. And it was like... This is what it's saying. This is the very thing I'm struggling with, and this is what it's saying. And for me now to go against that would have been to go directly against the truth and light that was shed before me. And so I knew what my answer was. Hard as it was to go back and tell them, no, I can't do it. That's what I had to do. Because that's what I had to do to walk in light. Sometime after that, you know, with the light we had, like, in, in my opinion, that was the light that we had, that I had at that time, is that I cannot take part of these, I cannot have fellowship with these works of darkness. And so we, we moved to, to northern Missouri, and we had this, this, uh, this little new Amish group that was going to be clean, it was going to have high moral standards. It was going to be a pure church. But God was not done shedding some light on our path. And He moved a family right into the midst of us. People who were not Amish, but they were walking in light. People who's, who were following the teachings of Christ. Whose wife and daughters were modestly dressed and had their heads covered. But we couldn't have true fellowship with these people because they weren't Amish. And it's like God saying, okay, now, you've done what I've told you back here. You've removed yourself from this fellowship of unfruitful works of darkness. Are you going to have fellowship with the people who, with my people who are walking in light? And to make a long story short, that's what happened. I mean, we ended up being separated from this group because there was more light to follow. And then we went on for a few years trying to figure out what the church is. We believed that there was one church. But we had a, we had a lot of evangelical theology and it was hard to make these things fit together until we heard a simple kingdom, what the simple kingdom message is. It made sense. That's what has, that's in it in a short story, what ended up bringing us down here to southern Missouri to walk with these brothers here. Uh, <clears throat> you know the... Uh, I think it's in Matthew 9, maybe, where Jesus said, A man does not put new wine in old wineskins, else it breaks these, these wine bottles. Old wineskins were at one time expandable, they had room to grow. 
and then they reached their maximum growth, and they became hard. That was as far as they wanted to go. And if you put new wine in there that wanted to purify itself, that wanted to be sanctified, it would burst these bottles because these bottles were as far as they wanted to go. And that's kind of like if I if I try to put kind of in an allegory a lot of what happened. I see this, I see us as having been like in a shell, like in some big shell. And this shell may have had a few windows that some light trickled in, but there was a lot of dark corners inside. And for those who wanted this light, for those who, like you can preach about new wine, and not too many people get upset. But you start preaching against old wineskins, and you have the wrath of them all coming upon you. Like you try to cut more windows into these shells, these shells are not wanting to grow. They are where they want to be. They don't want light. That's why new wine, the new life, cannot be put into the old covenant. Jesus, the life that Jesus preached and gave us cannot be put, cannot be put into an old covenant system. Neither can the new life, the new kingdom, the kingdom life of Christ, the man who wants to walk in light, who wants to be sanctified and purified, cannot be cannot stay and exist in one of these shells who has reached has reached the point where it wants to be and does not want to be does not want to grow further but we are to walk in light and to walk in light is a process it's like a it's a process for us and it's a process for the church Jesus said the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. You have to do violence to get out of these and to get into the path and to keep walking. And you may find yourself, eventually you may find yourself in another shell that maybe has a few more windows than the one you were in. There's more light. As long as you're walking in light, But if you keep walking in light, you'll probably end up breaking out of that one. In John 1... I'll read read verses 1 to 9. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was a true light. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. Uh, I 
The light did not come into the world. I mean, the light does. Like, if you, if you get out of, of some of this, if, if, if you've been walking in darkness and you've been stumbling all over these stumbling blocks and falling into the filth and the mud of this world and you've got all these stains upon you, or if you've been in one of these shells and you have all the, the dust and the cobwebs of these dark corners all over you, and, and you break out of these and you come into light, it does shed some light on what you've stumbled over. You see the things you've stumbled over, and you know what they are, but it does another thing. It sheds light onto the filth that's on you. I think this is what he's saying when he says in verse 9 there, there was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. If we think walking in the light is that we simply gain a whole bunch of knowledge about everything that's false, then we've missed a lot of what's walking in the light. In fact, we're probably not walking in the light, if that's all we can see. Christ wants to sanctify us. You know, one thing that's, that's often troubling to me is how many people that I've met and meet continually who think they're in the light. But I think I'm in the light too. But we're far from believing the same things. I mean, in some cases, maybe just within Christendom, there's this, uh, there's some, some differences, some minor, some major differences. But even, like, even people of other religions think that because of something they've gone through, they've left darkness and are in light. Like, I've heard that and there, I know there's people in here who know more about the, the Freemasons than I do, but I've heard that one of the things they do when they want to become a Mason is they knock on the door of a Masonic lodge and somebody asks them, what do you seek? And they say, I seek the light. And they open, them up, open it up and these people have the um, opportunity to enter into this secret brotherhood. It's pretty easy to see that this is like... Satan setting him up as, as an angel of light because he does that. Jesus is the true light. But, but apart from some of those cases or like other religions and so forth, um, like back at the time when I looked at that scripture in Ephesians 5, and I knew what to do, and I did it. If I would have become satisfied with that, and if I wouldn't have pursued the light further, then I wouldn't be here. But I could well convince myself that I have light, because I know I was in darkness at one time. And I saw some light, and I stepped in it. But this is a process. It doesn't say stand in the light. It says walk in the light. Think about Christian and the Pilgrim's Progress. When he came through the slough of despond, and after he was through, and he looked back, and it was like, hey, I made it through there. But he meets up with worldly wise men who counseled him to go off over to this other place, and he actually started off. And it became very fearful, but if he just would have went, 
and his eyes would have adjusted to the darkness in there. He could have well remembered what it was and how it was in the city of destruction, how it was going through the Slough of Despond. And he would probably think he's better off now than he was, and he could think that he was standing, he was in light. Yet he missed the path, and he didn't continue walking in light. We have these, my wife and daughters planted these little tomato plants, seeds, this year. And we had, a, we had this tray of tomato uh, soil and seeds sitting there about, about as far as from here to that window, away from the windows in front of our house. And when these things started growing, they were all going toward that light. And we'd turn them around. And then they'd just turn around and go back toward light, and we'd turn them around again. And they'd just, they'd just like, if this was like, if we were the world... And Satan and all the evil workers are trying to spin us around and take us through whirlwinds and confuse us. Just like we were turning this tray, trying to keep them from just going one way, but they just got up and just followed light. If we'd have taken them to another part of the house, they just would have found the light and they would have stretched toward that. That's what we've got to be pursuing. And concerning, concerning people who have, like, come to a place where they want to be, where they're comfortable with, people who stop pursuing light, the Spirit can leave somebody without that person ever realizing that the Spirit has left him. It happened to Samson. Samson was this... We think of Samson as this, just this powerful man. But when you read the account of Samson, whenever he did some of these mighty things, like when he tore that lion to pieces, when he packed up those big doors on the, of the city and carried them up on the hill and slew the Philistines with the jawbone, it always says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he did these things. And when, he was, when Delilah was trying to... De- uh, trying to get this secret out of him. And, and then he would tell her something and, and, and she'd have the Philistines being waiting on him and he, she'd say, the Philistines are upon you. And he'd jump up and he'd go just drive them out. It's because the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he drove them out. But then when he told her the real secret, and she said, the Philistines are upon you, It says he got up and he was going to go out and drive him out like he did before. I think when Samson got up, he did not feel different. It says he did not know that the Spirit had left him. The other other day when Brother Ryan and I were going to Fayetteville, or Fort Smith, I mean. We got to talking about the Spirit. There's like things that seem so simple. Like Jesus said, wouldn't you, if, if, your, if your son asked you for an egg, would you give him a scorpion? Or for a fish, would you give him a, a, a stone? Um, or maybe it was for bread for a stone. But anyway, he says, how much more, if you can give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father give the Holy Spirit to him that asks? Like, it just seems pretty simple. And there's, uh, but then there's these places, there's these other places, like in Acts 19, I believe it is, where, where we read how, how Paul met up with these people who, uh, it says they were, um, anyway, he, they had only known of the baptism of John, 
But after, after they had... Um, Paul ended up laying his hands on these people and they received the Holy Spirit and started speaking in tongues and prophesying. Like, hmm, that puts a new dimension on that. Like, there's things about the Spirit that I can't understand. Maybe I'm being a little too mystical. Maybe they just started speaking scriptures and speaking other languages. That might be well. But, but still, it's something we don't it's something that we don't see very much. But there's other things we know. I mean, there's things like that that seem to be happening maybe in, in some form or another of people who aren't even following the light or the truth or the way that Christ taught. Um, like deceptions. And we know that Satan's got all kinds of counterfeits and deceptions. But all, all what we were saying is that there may be something about the Holy Spirit that we don't know. There very well may be. After all, who can, who can figure out all the mysteries of God and things about the Holy Spirit? Who is like the wind, which we can't see. <clears throat> I'd like to read it first John one and Brother Raymond read some of this, but I'm just gonna read it again. Starting in verse five. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin... We are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You know, if, like I was saying earlier, like walking in light is a, it's a walk. It's not standing in light. It's a progression toward light. So if, if I'm somewhere here in, in the shadows or in darkness, and a light in the distance shines on me and shows me some things, and I start walking toward that light, what's going to happen as I get closer and closer and closer to that light? It's going to shine brighter and brighter and brighter on me. And it's going to reveal and show me some of the filth and sins that still lurk in my flesh. I think we've heard... I I think I've heard like a... Kind of almost avoiding of these verses 8. Like verses 8 where it says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. And I know why. I mean, I know what evangelical Christianity is saying. We can never be free from sin. We just have to trust in the blood of Christ. And that, um, you know, he just sees the blood. And, and But this verse is here. And I think, if we think we can walk toward that light without continually the Lord revealing things in our life, things that are lurking in our flesh that we need to repent of and be sanctified of, if we deny that, we're deceiving ourselves. And I think that is walking in the light and that's when the blood of Christ cleanses us from sin. We become cleansed as we walk, 
as these things become revealed and as we recognize them, confess them, and repent of these things. I also think that verse 7, where it says, But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus the Son cleanses us from all sin. Oftentimes when I hear this, hear this being spoken, like people are saying that if we walk in the light, we have fellowship one with another, making it sound like brothers who are walking in the light have fellowship with one another. And it, I mean, that's, that's not an unscriptural uh, statement. Although I, I'm not sure, when I read that verse, let's read it real like carefully. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, he, the in Christ, we have fellowship one with another. We in Christ have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus' son cleanses us from all, Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Uh, anyway, I just, uh, but, but there is, like, there's this, there's this unity between Christ, between God, Christ, and us, and we, it says we, who are walking in light. But I think, anyway, it, there's this verse in Hebrews um, 2.11 that says, Both he that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all one, and he is not ashamed to call us brethren. Never allow yourselves to just think because my heart tells me that I'm clean that I'm clean the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked this this purification or sanctification or walking in light is a process to the very end of our lives if we want to become in his image There is no stopping point for us. That's something we need to know about ourselves. It's like... That's just, if we don't want to deceive ourselves, we need to keep that in mind. And I think whole churches can be completely lacking the knowledge of themselves. That's the case with the church at Laodicea. She thought she was rich. She thought that she was clothed and mighty and good. And Jesus said, you don't know that you are wretched and poor and blind and naked and miserable. Can you imagine the blow of these voices or or this message coming from Christ to this church who thought they were everything they needed to be? what would our reaction be? Like there's other churches there in, 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 in Revelations 2 and 3 that were maybe not as bad as the church of Laodicea. In fact, there was, a, there was like the church in Ephesus
the angel to the church of, in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false and you have perseverance and have endured in my name's sake and have not grown weary. Sounds pretty good. I wouldn't mind hearing that. But he goes on to say, But I have this against you that you have left your first love. Therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. take old wine that is done purifying it'll be just fine in an old wine skin because it's it's as far as it's going to go and so is the wine skin they'll be just fine together but if you want new wine and you want to keep being sanctified and purified You won't fit into one of these old wineskins anymore. And it may be like this church at Ephesus. It can be like this church at Ephesus. It looks pretty good. I mean, there was probably, probably only Christ. Maybe you, this may have manifested itself in some ways where some people could see it, but only Christ almost could look down at this church and says, here's your problem. You've left your first love. Because they were doing a lot of good things. They were not tolerating evil men. They were... I mean, it's just it's sobering what, what this church looked like And yet Christ demands that they repent or the lampstand will be removed. Are we in for the long haul? Are we in to... Are we like the children of Israel who when they were taking in Canaan, after a whole bunch of victories and hard battles, they were like, this is good enough. This is good enough. We'll settle with this. Or think about those ten virgins who had lamps. Bear in mind, it doesn't say there were five virgins and five harlots. These were ten virgins, and they all had lamps. But five of them were foolish, and they only had fuel until their lights went out, and that was it. The others were prepared to make the long haul. They were ready to wait and be patient and endure if it takes longer than you think it should and keep their lights burning. Think about Paul. Here's this man who endured such great tribulations. And he wrote these beautiful verses in Philippians 3. If you turn there, we'll read those. But I want you to remember, he did not read these verses He did not write these verses, I should say. 
like soon after he came to Damascus. This was once he was an older man. This was like after he had been uh, whipped 39 times, five, time, five times he was, he was whipped, um, 40 stripes save one. He was beaten with rods. He was stoned. This was after his perils in the city and his perils in the wilderness, his perils in the sea and with robbers and his own countrymen and with heathens and with false brethren. This was after all this. After much journeying. After he had told the churches, I am free of the blood because I have not withheld from telling you all the truth. This was his journey. This was the walk he walked. And now here he's in Rome. He's sitting in prison near the end of his life. And this is what he writes in Philippians 3. I'll start reading verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that which Also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Think about the time... I, I think back about the time when like when I was having this great big struggle on whether I should have fellowship with these unfruitful works of darkness and the light shone on this and I accepted this light. That was the way to walk in the light. This is the standard to live by. When we see light, we walk in it. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I have often told you and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior." the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has, that he has even to subject all things to himself. Like to read a passage in 1 Thessalonians yet? Chapter 4. Starting in verse 1, it says, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus Christ that as you receive from us instructions as how you ought to walk and please God just as you exactly do walk, that you excel even more. 
still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passions like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Verse 9 and 10. Now as to love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and to and attend to your own business and work with your hands, just as we commanded you, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. I think I'll stop there. Um, I just, uh, <coughs> yes, these, this admonition and counsel is first for me, but I just want to encourage all of us in that, in all areas, in brotherly love, that we excel even more. and in all areas of our life. <clears throat> Anybody has any comments or something to add? Feel free. aware of it if we're not always stretching, stretching, stretching for the light. I had to think of, you know, the plants, you you just barely, unless you wait too long, you just barely notice, you know, you turn them, 